10 people is not going to save my restaurant in the long term, but it's a start. And the team's there, we're all there. Let's let's dive in the deep end. Let's not let's not just wait and see. It's a good warm up and a and a roll on. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Pivot. It's a word many of us thought we'd never use that much. But sadly, it's a word that's been forced on the restaurant industry. For many operators, their restaurant is their life investment. Most operators in Australia are family-owned, family-run, small businesses that have been forced to do anything to survive. Stuart Knox, owner of Fix Wine Bar and Restaurant, is one of Australia's most awarded and respected sommeliers and restaurateurs. Stuart, how are you going? I'm good, Anthony. How are you? I'm good, mate. Now, we've been in touch quite a bit over the last eight weeks. I mean, it feels like eight years. Um, But we spoke initially when I wrote an article about the collapse of the industry, and um, it's actually been interesting to watch everything you've been doing um, to save your business. And um, how are you feeling right now? I'm tired, <laughs> very tired. Um, I, yeah, yes, the word pivot is something that uh, I, 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 I think of pivot, but I then think of pirouette and I think <laughs> I've been spinning around and around and around and I'm incredibly dizzy. I think, uh, I think it was uh, Jackie who was talking about being punch drunk and I sort of really totally understand that sort of statement. Yeah. Um, tired but excited all at the same time. It's uh, – it's been a very, as you said, it's been a very long eight weeks. Um, I was, someone mentioned to me the other day, they said, oh, so at least you've had a bit of t- downtime, a bit of rest time, and you're sort of ready to go again. And I said, well, actually, no, I'm absolutely buggered because, and then I thought about it as I was answering it. And I thought, well, actually, I've launched about five or seven different businesses in the space of six weeks. So uh, it's, it's been interesting. But I've actually, look, I've loved it. I have really loved it. Well, that's really interesting. Let's go back over that. And when when this all first sort of happened and, you know, your restaurant is in the CBD of Sydney and you have the challenges of the different uh, restaurant models that are in the in the CBD just generally as an operator, um, do you want to talk about what actually happened when the pandemic landed? And then let's look at all of these different businesses that you've launched since. Yeah, well... Look, I, th- I think we can. We all we all know that the restaurant industry had been in uh, dire straits for a lot longer than the last eight weeks. We'd we'd had a pretty tough 2019, and I'd spent a lot of time in January and February of this year after the damage that was done to our business with the bushfires, just re- reduction in spend and things like that, thinking about what what I could do and so on and so forth. And to a degree, there was a lot of thought during there that did I really want to do it? I was, I was pretty much burnt out at that point. Wow. Um, because it was just, it was getting really hard. And I, I could look at it and say, look, I know where the problem is, but one restaurant can't fix it. You need a, you need a, a we needed a paradigm shift. Um, I didn't realize it was coming quite so quickly. Um, and then we sort of, I was watching this, this thing in China sort of from mid late February and it was starting to be popping up around the world and I just thought to myself, oh, this is going to be interesting. This could knock the financial markets around a bit, um, that we might have a little bit of a, a dip there, so I've got to keep an eye on that. Um, at no point, none of this was even close to thinking, was I thinking about what actually happened. Then our, as March rolled through and then that, that eventful last week, um, I just kept waking up in the morning and looking at my phone, just going, "What's going to change today?" And uh, it just it, it's because it's now eight or nine weeks ago. I, I can I can feel it emotionally, internally, but it's I can't even really put it into a timeline anymore. It was just a blur. It really was just a blur. Was that punch drunk thing coming back again? Then someone was just wounding on my head, bang, 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 going, oh, what's going on? What's next? What's next? So by the time we hit that Friday, we don't open on the weekend. So that Friday, we went into Friday night with the one person per four square metres. We'd had a 
and we, I think everyone sort of knew something was changing rapidly and offices were clearing out. So we actually, we turned away probably about three sittings worth of people that Friday because everyone trying to get in for their last hurrah. Um, it was all very, it was, mm. now it feels sort of still feels surreal. It's sort of hard to say that it even happened at all. But at the time, yeah, I was I was just in fight or flight mode, really. It's interesting to hear you say that before this pandemic, you were questioning whether you wanted to be in the game anymore and whether you had the energy to do it. And yet, although there's been so many people that have been adapting and trying to you know, survive, you've been like – out of control, busy. Like you, it's like there's, it's, it's like there's ten of you. Um, so it's, that's a that's a pretty big shift from where you were before the pandemic to then fighting for something. Um, how did you feel in that period? Yeah, look, it's it, I and and it's something I've been thinking about a bit too. And I suppose there was a because of, I I knew I was in that that mental space where I wasn't sure whether I wanted to keep doing it or not. This gave me, I suppose this to a degree brought some clarity to me and went, actually, I really do love what I do. Um, I had a funny conversation with my wife who has been incredibly patient with me being around the house a lot more. Um, and she, I was, um, we were chatting away and I, I was, I was having this moment where I'm going, right, well, can we, can we put a, fire pit out in the backyard and open the garage door and at least people could walk past with a beer and say hello and a few 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 of the dads around in the same street wandered we just sort of wandered up and down the back lane um anyway i was chatting away so on and so forth and anyway that was that was by the by and my wife said to me you know realize that for the past sort of six or seven years you get to the weekend and you don't want to see anyone, you don't want to go out, you don't want to talk to anyone, anyone. You, you're just done and you're over it. Yeah. You do realise that you're doing right now everything you can to go and talk to people. So perhaps you don't hate the restaurant as much as you think. Maybe it's just that you're a bit tired and actually you're actually in the right job after all. And I sort of took that and went, yeah, you're probably right actually. I was just, I was just a bit burnt out realistically. And at that point, I went, right, well, she might be right there. And so what can I do? And frankly, a lot of these things that I've, I have started were things that were on the, in the back of my mind anyway of value adds to the business to try and keep it rolling. I just hadn't found the time, the energy, the enthusiasm to make those things happen. And I, I saw... When I, I, not an opportunity as in that it was a way of cashing in, but an opportunity to, to reinvigorate all of those things while I wasn't trying to work out, while I wasn't trying to run plates and open bottles, I suppose. Can you tell us about some of the things that you tried initially and, um, and then I guess that can lead us to where you are now? Yeah, so in that, in that last week, when that last week when it was all, when the shit was most definitely hitting the fan, that's when I, I jumped. I thought, well, this, this is not going to be, this is not going to end quickly and it won't end well if I don't do something. So that's, that's when I became somewhat of a rash on social media <laughs> and we really, I really did a big push on selling, uh, <laughs> selling um, some gift vouchers and we put those out as a discount because I thought this is a good way of getting some money in the bank for future, future sales. Um, cashing in on those because I was at that point I was looking down the barrel at how I could get my staff paid how I could pay my rent all of those things and I thought well that's that's the first easy one offer 20 odd percent off a gift voucher get them for sale online on our website and get those going so that was that was stage one um, then I followed that up with um, we've always had a retail online retail wine li- wine store um, which mostly sat dormant but it was there we do have the license and we've got the framework on the website so i thought right well if we do close then then i've got some wine stock let's try and work out what i can do with that so then we i jumped into the jumped into the mystery wine packs and got those out there and 
by this point, I think there was the thing about social media is that the people that follow you on social media, as a rule, are your customers, clients, and they're in theory your fans in some way, shape, or form. So I thought to myself, well, these guys are the ones that would like to buy wine from me because they came to the restaurant because they enjoyed buying wine from me. It's a slightly different version, but and they they went nuts. Absolutely nuts. I ate stuff in the back for two weeks from packing boxes, funnily enough. Um, and I went, right, okay, all well, the website's there, it's rolling along. Let me make a couple of calls. I'd been talking to a mate up on up in Queensland who was setting up a T-shirt printing business and I said, right, let's, let's get some T-shirts printed for the restaurant, which was once again something I was thinking about earlier in the year but went, right, we've got to get this done. Um, got those on the website had a chat to Mark Baldston at Riedel and he said, look, we're, we're sort of in the same boat as you. We can't sell our glassware through our normal retail um, department stores because no one's going to those. Is there something you'd be interested in working with there? Right, sure, let's get some glassware on the website. Um, and on and on it goes. I've, I've still got a list of about 10 different things that I wanted to get, which I haven't got on there actually, but one – the ideas actually come pretty easy. Me and uh, back end programming, and it's Tracy, my wife, who works, who's still working four days a week. She does most of the website work, so things don't get on there as quickly as as um, as we think of them. But we're getting there. We're getting there. Now, you took a bit of time out as well to sort of adjust and then launch a takeaway menu. Um, can you tell us about? why you took that time and and the success of of that model sure look i think certainly as as we've talked about i jumped very heavily into that merchandise and that side of things um i had I, on the monday after the the great calamity i had all the staff in the restaurant i'd spent the weekend finding out cuz as a small restaurant you're not really like I didn't know about standing down. I didn't know that rule actually existed. No, I'm sure 99% of the restaurants in Australia didn't know that that option was there available. So I got them in all on Monday and had the most difficult series of conversations I have ever had and I ever want to have, um, but walked away with such even higher levels of admiration and respect for my team at the way they handled it and the way they um, they just took it on the chin and said, yep, we understand totally. The most important thing is that we try and find a way to keep the business alive so that when we can reopen, we can all take up where we left off. And so then I spent that first week of closed packing more wine boxes than I could ever believe uh, job keeper got announced and I thought, right, okay, this could be something. And I just, with job keeper, I thought, I think there's something in this, but I don't want to run off in one tangent and then have the rug pulled out from under me again in such a short period of time. So I thought, I'll just wait and see a bit more information. We were coming up to the Easter long weekend and whilst I knew the city was getting more and more empty, we were in, in theory, school holiday time. Um, that was going to be the quietest period of the CBD. And I thought, there's just no, this is one that there's no need to rush. Let's just take a moment and step back and think about if I'm going to go, what else, what else is there? Do we do... Uh, the like a, a take home pack. Do we do pre cooked stuff? All of those things, or we do? Do we think? Oh, there's going to be people coming back into town. Some people are still in the office, and we had a good discussion. That there's a whole team. Once once I got, I got them back in and explained what was happening with JobKeeper and had a conversation with them and said, "Don't answer me now, but let's let's get a WhatsApp chat going and see what see what everyone thinks." And I, I think the overwhelming consensus, well, let's get back in, let's start doing some takeaway and go from there. So that decision was as much driven by the team as it was me. How did it feel that first time that you went back in there and cooking food and sending food out like that, that morning when you got up, how did you feel? Yeah, oh, that was, that was, that was cool. It was suddenly, it was a, it was a, a, a hint of normality in a, an otherwise chaotic, chaotic couple of weeks. So yeah, we 
we decided that we were just going to open that one Friday, give it a run, see what happened. And if there was a decent response, then we knew we were on the right track. If there was a mediocre response, we actually thought we'll do it for another week or two anyway and see how it goes. Um, and we got in there and we, I think we had three rolls on and a couple of bits and pieces, not much at all. Um, but the whole team was together again doing what it is that we do as a group. And my team, um, I think probably Mark, my head chef, is, is on the shortest tenure and I think he's five or six years he's been working with us. So um, we're, we're, we've spent a lot of time with each other over the past few years. And so it was just good to get the family back together again. As it turns out, we didn't prep anywhere near enough food and we were sold out of rolls, et cetera, and we were completely done by 1 o'clock. Wow. And I thought, yeah, okay, there could be something in this. So a little earlier you said that you've actually loved this period of time, which is an interesting response given the situation that the industry's in and the, the, the longevity of restaurants. Um, what is it about this period of time that's, that made you feel that way? Um, I think, look, it comes back to Fix is 14 years old and it's, it's gone through a lot of changes and iterations, but I suppose that's been a, a long, slow evolve and it's been me doing the same thing with slight variations for a long time and it comes back to me going, right, well, I'm sort of a bit bored of this. Um, I didn't realise I was bored at the time, but I probably was. And so this is like it's sort of I've, I've, it's, it's invigorating. It's terrifying, don't get me wrong, but in amongst all that as well, I've, I've reconciled for myself personally that the absolute worst-case scenario is terrible, but I won't die, my family won't die, I'll lose some money. So unfortunately, people will lose money if restaurant when restaurants go broke. That's the unfortunate thing, and I'm I'll feel terrible about that. But at the same time, because I have gone a bit manic and tried to do all of these things, I also know that look, I, I didn't I didn't leave anything in the tank, and it's just been it's just been exciting and invigorating. It's. I don't think I could keep it up for months and months and years and years, but it's just been a, I suppose, a, a little, uh, a little jolt to the system to make sure all the cylinders are firing again. You know, seven weeks ago, you sent me a text message in regards to what was going on, and I've thought about it many times. And you simply said, "If I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down swinging." And <laughs> um, <laughs> you've been swinging pretty hard. And, you know, you've actually given a lot of people um, inspiration. I've spoken about what you've been doing to other operators and um, there just seems to be this uh, renewed vigour in, in Stuart Knox 2020 pandemic. Uh, yeah, and look, that's, uh, that term swinging is something that I seem to have I've, I've taken on as my own, and yeah, people say, "How are you going?" And I'm, hey, I'm still swinging. <laughs> um, it's, but it's, yeah, it's. Look, I'm, I'm certainly not doing this to try and influence others, but, but at the same time, I'm, I'm amazed and surprised and uh, actually constantly surprised at the things that I come up with, and just amazed that. People find that inspiring and that's working for them. And I think at the end of the day, our industry is always about leading by example. And I don't want to be a leader, but if my example is leading people, then that's, well, that's awesome. Let's look at what's happening now. You know, there's an opportunity for the industry to open up, um, you know, through various stages. And, you know, there's different operators have different opinions on whether it's the right time to open or um, or not? Um, can you tell us what you're you're doing and um, and your thoughts about this gradual opening up of society? Yeah, look, uh, we opened. We most definitely were going to open as soon as they said we could. Um, look, that was that was possibly one of the areas of government that I have a criticism on is that they seem to like to do it really quickly. Um, so 
on Sunday. I didn't expect to be opening on last Friday, that's for sure. But it, for me, and ev- look, every, every business is different, but for me, 10 people in my restaurant with, with the appropriate um, time slots and things like that makes it worthwhile to be throwing open the doors on top of all the other things that we're doing. It's not – 10 people is not going to – not going to save my restaurant in the long term, but it's a start. And I, I suppose it gets back to that takeaway thing as well, is the team's there, we're all there, let's, let's, let's dive in the deep end. Let's not, let's not just wait and see. Um, as, as that moves on, I'm, I'm quite happy to spend a few weeks doing 10 as we can iron out some systems and get out get ourselves and our heads into gear so that when we go to 20 we're ready for it I think it's a it's a it's a good warm-up and a and a roll on um, the industry's got a hell of a long way to go even at stage three with with a capacity of technically of a hundred those um, social distancing rules will still restrict my place and most places to significantly lower numbers than what their actual capacity is so we're not we're certainly not out of the woods yet. What What's going to help? Well, is there some government initiatives that could come into play that can help restaurants in this period? Look, from from my my angle on it, I think the job keeper has been amazing. There, we may, depending on the speed of which we relax these things, we may need that job keeper to roll on for specific industries for a bit longer. Uh, the rental rental abatement and things like that is also one area that may not be able to just be switched off in a few months' time, um, and that that goes the same for personal and business loans. Those six month periods, it's going to be there's going to be a whole heap of things that all come together at one point. So some of those might have to be stretched out a bit more. In that side, um, I know I know there's been a lot of talk in the industry and going public about encouraging people to go out into to a restaurants like the abolishment of fringe benefits tax to me would be the the number one thing government could do to encourage spending in my business because we're a corporate restaurant per se that would be huge for us i think uh, there's look there's a lot of a lot of little things as well but and there's I do understand that government's got to find a, a balance between handing out money and trying to actually get some of it back too. So it is going to be a tricky time coming forward. Um, I think as an industry, we have to look at ourselves long and hard and see where where our failings have been and as an industry, correct them on a whole. There's no point me running down the road going, right, we're going to do all this because this is the way to make a restaurant successful when 99% of the other restaurants just go back to the status quo. That's that's going to be the trickiest part. That's not a government problem. That's an industry problem, though. How would you address those, and what what are the positives to come out of this? Do you think to make a better hospitality industry? Well, I see this as a clean slate, and um, it's a very ugly way of getting a clean slate. But I don't think we were ever going to have it any other way. Um, so, with restricted numbers for any restaurant, you've got to then start looking at your booking times and your booking slots and having to turn tables and do things like that. So, for instance, on Friday we sat 10 people every hour and a half for six hours, so we did 60 people. So that worked out not too bad for a, for a first, day, first day hit out. Now, two months ago, if I tried to get someone to come in for a lunch at 3 o'clock out by 4.30, they would have just laughed me off. But that's going to have to be the new norm. And realistically, that could be the way that restaurants can make their way back into the world and actually have a healthy bottom line. Uh, Restaurants aren't a public service as much as many customers seem to think we are. Um, So we have to be able to make a profit. And profit's not a dirty word in the context of we're all averaging 3% profit margin That's just ridiculous. There's no room for error in that. I'm not talking about a 50% profit margin, but around 10 or 15 would be sort of handy to say the least. Um, So that change in mindset, and I suppose actually this does come back around to 
to government influence. Why does everyone in the CBD have to work from Monday to Friday, nine to five? Now, we already know in Sydney that we don't have the public transport capacity to bring everyone in and maintain social distancing at the same time. So that government encouragement for the larger corporations to spread their workforce, not only some at home, some at work, but some starting earlier, some starting later. Then we can, then if someone starts work at 7, then an 11.30 lunch slot seems all right. And if someone starts work at 11, then a 3 o'clock lunch slot is probably okay as well. And then we follow that on into retail where, well, if everyone's working 9 to 5, why does David Jones open at 10 and close at 5 as well? So why is retail opening and closing within the window that everyone's technically at work? There's a, that's a bigger conversation I think government can provide to try and stretch that out. Now, that then leads beautifully into the City of Sydney and New South Wales government trying to revive the nighttime economy in the city. If I can have 70% capacity of my restaurant from 11am to 9pm, I'm in a far better position than with the same staff members having 105% capacity at 12.30 and then at 6 and then be completely empty the rest of the time. With all of that, um, how do you see things panning out though in the next couple of weeks and um, what do you hope happens in the next six months? Um, well, in the next few weeks, I think we're just people are people ran out on the weekend and there was a bit of an explosion of people being everywhere. I think that was that was always going to be the case. You open the gates and people run straight through them. But then I think everything I think for the next few weeks people will settle down into this new stage and then we'll see it just becoming a bit more uh, uh, probably a bit more consistent these stages that we're talking about they're saying a minimum of three weeks so I don't think in the past two months anything's gone for three weeks without changing dramatically so we might find there's just a bit more routine um coming into it and that'd be that would be nice I can I know myself that I can start thinking a bit further in the future when I can see that, well, that's what's happened this week actually happened the next week as well. So just uh, that's how I see the next six weeks going, that 10 to 20. Six months down the track, well, hopefully we've, we've eradicated or vaccined or cured this particular virus in one way, shape or form. That's obviously the hope. But... The reality is probably we're not quite there yet, but we would hopefully would be very close. And in that at that six month point, that we as restaurateurs have gently and politely educated the our patrons about the reality of a restaurant and what it's going to cost to eat in a restaurant. And if we don't want to put our prices up, and I understand that pricing is a is coming into a, a recession I think we're about to is going to be always a tricky thing. Trying to put our prices up 20% across the board is going to be hard to manage because someone else will chase the bottom and will some of us some would be left high and dry. But then so look at it from a different angle and find a different way of bringing more more revenue through the door. So that's that spread. So that that would be really nice to see most restaurateurs get on board with booking systems, out by times, um, and the the one biggie which has popped up already this week is that we've got to start either getting people to prepay or at least put their credit card down so if they no-show, they get charged. I wanted to ask you about that because there was a lot of uh, restaurants complaining already over the weekend about people not turning up. <laughs> yes, and that's and that's... That's just that one that I, I as me, much as my other restaurateur mates would rage about that. If we don't, as as the industry, change the way the system works, people are always going to no show. They're always going to make bookings at three different places, or they're going to look outside and it's a bit rainy and think, "No, I don't really want to go." But if it's just like at the aeroplanes, the, the planes, if you just rocked up and said, right, I feel like flying to Bali today, here's my $600, well, clearly that doesn't work, does it? <laughs> but 
But as restaurants, we seem to believe that that's what we have to do. It's all like we are by our very nature incredibly hospitable. That's why we do what we do because we care and we look after people. But we're not there. To, we care too much and we worry too much about some people's opinions that in fact we're just being taken advantage of. That's not hospitable. That's not being hospitable. It's sort of just a ignorance. So it's hard to make those changes one by run restaurant in a on a normal playing field. But yeah, the playing field's just been upended. So let's we've just got to do something about that. And it's it's really simple. Every there's a million booking systems out there, all of which have a way of making sure that someone's put their credit card. Look, there's always going to be someone that puts in a fake number and so on and so forth. That's that's life as we know it, but it certainly would it will cut the wheat from the chafe. And anyone that says, oh, I'm not going to book because I don't want to put my credit card in, you pretty much guarantee you were planning on no-showing. So it, there's no harm, no foul. Yeah. How has this um, pandemic changed your perceptions of food, wine and restaurants? Um, geez, I like putting food on plates, not in cardboard boxes. <laughs> Um, I think there's a there's a a few things I think that I I look back and having listened to your other podcasts and I think about what I miss about restaurants and what I don't miss about restaurants is that it's it's the feeling it's that vibe that sort of that hustle and bustle of a busy restaurant bar that's that's the thing it's not about the celebrity chef or the the fancy sommelier or the uh, the one that's got his a uh, master of wine or anything like that they're they're all amazing for the industry and that's pr and that gets brings the romance but really it's just it's 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 a theater and we all I, I talk about it with Tristan my restaurant manager we have we have worked together mostly for 18 years so with like the old married couple I spent more time with Tristan than my family that's for sure but we we just talk about it as being a theatre and like certainly Tristan and I are not theatrical people in that respect but I just I miss the show and I can't wait to wait to get the show go, going again and what I found on Friday is that even with 10 people we can we can have the show we can have the full song and dance number and that's that's something I can't replicate it in my house. It's not something I can replicate through takeaway. It's not something I can replicate through Zoom. Well, I haven't worked out how to yet, but hold that thought. <laughs> well, mate, you're one of the great restaurateurs and one of the great psalms that takes all the intimidation out of that wine and food experience, and you have an uncanny knack of matching wines with food. I just wonder, you know, what would you match – with the pandemic, um, everything. <laughs> um, yeah, I've had I've had a few nights here where I've pretty much drunk everything I could find in in those those slightly darker moments. <laughs> um, but the pandemic needs champagne. Now I realise that's an unusual choice, but there's something about good champagne, and I mean, and I do mean real champagne, not just sparkling wine. But there's something just so pleasing and so sort of uplifting as, as a glass full of fantastic bubbles and that just that all those nuances and things going on there that just sort of lifts the soul when when it's otherwise being sort of dragged down by COVID. That's actually quite amazing. I'd actually, I wouldn't mind actually one of those right now. I think I'm going to have to go to, go to the bottle shop. <laughs> Um, well, mate, very keen to hear how everything goes over the next um, period of time. Like your energy has been bloody inspiring and you're a bloody legend. And um, look, as you know, I've been trying to get you on this series since day dot and we finally got there series two. Um, but thank you, mate, and please keep in touch and no doubt we're going to talk again pretty soon. Mate, thank you very much. Um, it's been so 
inspiring for me as well just to listen to everyone's stories the the way you you've pulled this together and the people you've got you've covered you covered such a such a broad spectrum of the industry in all its facets for being it's just been so great to listen to everyone's stories and I tell you what I, it's just been so inspiring from my side as well to basically listen to all these people in the hospitality industry all fighting for one another and fighting for a way back there hasn't there's just no one's no one's giving up and with that whole thing I couldn't bring myself to give up when no one else is either so yeah well done you and yeah. Rob in the background as well thanks mate oh Rob is Rob is the engine um he's a machine mate thanks again and uh we'll talk soon cheers mate thank you very much for the chance to have a chat catch you soon buddy This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.